Welcome to the podcast of Grace Community Bible Church. We hope and pray that you are blessed, challenged, and inspired by this message. For other sermons or more information, visit us at gracebiblechurch.org.au. John Newton visited a Christian family that had suffered the loss of fire of all that they had possessed. He greeted the mother of the family with these words, I give you joy, madam. Surprised, she exclaimed, What? Joy that all my property has been consumed and destroyed? Oh no, he answered. But joy that you have so much property that no fire can touch. And this, you know, this just put her grief to check and she wiped her tears and smiled and looked up to heaven and thanked God. See, what John Newton was trying to do is to get her to gaze her eyes upon that future hope and that future glory that was coming, that is kept reserved for her, that no fire in this world would be able to touch. In a similar way, as we've started looking at this wonderful book of First Peter, that's what Peter is doing in the first few, particularly in the first chapter of this book. And as we saw in the last couple of weeks, these are young Christians who are scattered in the Asia Minor region. And as they are faithfully following Christ, they're beginning to find hostility around them. Because the rest of the world is on a different trajectory. They do not honor God. They do not walk according to his ways. And so as they follow Christ, they find that there are certain people who are slandering them. Certain people who are mocking them. They're finding difficulties in their families, families where certain family members don't follow Christ and they're following Christ. And, and th- there's difficulties happening there. There's difficulties in the workplace and in the government level. And so they're confused. They, they don't understand, but this is the Christian life. This is, this is the, uh, you know, we're following the true and living God. We're following Jesus Christ. Why is all this happening? And so Peter hears about this and he wants to encourage them. And so this entire letter is a letter of encouragement. And he's doing this to make them stand firm in their faith. To remind them, this is the grace of God. Stand firm in it. And so as he begins this letter, the one thing we saw in the introduction was he, he tells them a basic reality that you need to remember is that you are a chosen exile. And what that means is you're not forsaken by God. You're not abandoned by God. In fact, it's the very opposite. God has handpicked you. He has chosen you from before the foundation of the world to be his child, to be his representative. But what what that means is, even as that vertical relationship has changed, your horizontal relationship with this world has also been changed. There's been a break. It means that now you're an exile in this world, or you're a foreigner in this world. That this place is not your home. Home is where God and Jesus is. And that will happen when Christ finally returns. So you need to keep that at the forefront of your mind. And then last week we saw how he was reminding them, well really, verses 3 to 12, it's one long sentence in the original language. And this first section we looked at, verses 3 to 5, it reminded them of that living hope that they have that was coming their way. And so to be encouraged uh, in even while they walk through this hostile world. And this morning, he's going to focus again on on the great salvation that we have, but he's going to get into more so a specific point that's to do with the joy that we experience because of our salvation and because of who God is. And so just by way of outline, I, I, I want to say this. I want to ask a question first, 
and the outline will give us the answer. When you're going through difficulties, when you're going through trials for, uh, for being a Christian, for following Christ, why should you still rejoice in the midst of those trials? Well, there are three reasons from verses 6 through 7. Firstly, you have reason to rejoice in the midst of your trials because of your hope. That's in verse 6. The second reason you can rejoice in the midst of your trials is because of your faith, and that's in verse 7. And the third reason you can rejoice is because of your love, and that's in verses 8 through to 9. So let's begin by looking at the first reason for why you can rejoice in the midst of trials for following Jesus Christ. Verse 6. Peter says, In this rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Peter begins by saying, In this you rejoice. Well, what's he referring to? Everything that he mentioned from verses 3 to 5. Rejoice in in who God is and the hope that he has given you. Rejoice in the mercy of God, this God that you know through Christ. Rejoice in that great mercy by which you have been given spiritual life. Rejoice in the fact that now as a result that you have a living hope. Rejoice in the fact that you have this confident expectation that the best is still yet to come. It is not now. You know that you will have an eternal life and an inheritance and even now you're being preserved by God's powerful hand to keep you uh, going till the end. So in this undying hope of salvation, of this eternal salvation, Peter says, in this, rejoice. See, it's a joy that's based on our certain hope. Remember last week we looked at this. This hope, it's not wishful thinking. It's not optimist, or like some kind of a naive optimism. It's not blind faith. It's not baseless hope. It's a hope that's based on and guaranteed by the undeniable historical fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, just as Jesus was resurrected and uh, brought about and given this new life, so also you will be resurrected and have eternal life. This hope is guaranteed and it will come to fruition. See, essentially, this is what Peter is saying. As a Christian, when you're reminded of this great salvation, of the hope of your great salvation and and what, what is really coming, when you meditate on this certain future glory, the response is nothing but praise to God. And joy within yourselves that is, that is not deterred by any circumstance in this world. See, our understanding, our understanding of God and Christ and, and that salvation that they will bring about, it's not just a theoretical thing. It's not some uh, a- academic thing j- just for the sake of knowledge. No, it's a knowledge and understanding of God and Christ that will transform how you and I will live in this world. In fact, it will even determine that kind of lasting joy that you can experience in this world. But look at the context in which Peter says you have this joy. Look at verse 6 again. He says, In this you rejoice, Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. See, Peter's being real here. He understands they've got struggles as they live as Christians. And that's why he says, though now you have been grieved by various trials. You know, I love this about the Bible. It never ignores reality. It never ignores the pain that we go through in trials. He 
He says, yes, you're grieved by it. And he also says, and grieved not just by one trial, but various trials. Various trials, some, some long, some short, some very severe, some not as severe. And trials in the home, trials in the workplace, in, in, in school, in the neighborhood, in the culture at large. If you are living as a Christian without compromising, you are going to face trials of different colors and shapes. So here, here's what he's trying to get at. Yes, it's going to be hard to live as a Christian. It will cause you grief as you live in a world that is opposed to God's ways. But it's not a joyless following of Christ. It's a joyful following of Christ. Now, if you're thinking, I don't understand, Benoit. I mean, how can I have joy when these various trials cause me grief and pain? Because your joy is not in the trial, but in God and Christ and what is coming your way, that salvation that is going to come to you. That living hope that you've been made alive to. So there's, there's grief on the one side because of the trials, but there's also lasting joy. And scripture puts both these together in other passages. I'll, I'll, I'll just read one passage, which is 2 Corinthians 6.10, which talks about being sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. And this is Paul speaking here. Sorrowful, why? Because of the afflictions brought about because he was following Christ. There was beatings, imprisonment, you know, being without food and so on and so forth. So many afflictions, so many sorrows, so many trials. And yet he says, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Rejoicing, why? Because of the Lord and the blessings that he's pouring out and will come. Or Philippians 4.4, 4, it says, rejoice in the Lord always. That's a command that is calling us to find our joy in the Lord regardless of the circumstance. Because that kind of transcendent joy, it's not found in anything else other than the Lord himself. And we saw this even in Habakkuk as we went through Habakkuk. Right in the end of the book, where he says, I have joy now. And it wasn't in the circumstance or what was coming his way. What was coming his way in Habakkuk, remember? It was the Babylonians. They were kind, coming to decimate the kingdom of Judah. Yet he says he's fearful and, and, and in some sense causing some grief to his soul. And yet he says, I'm joyful. Because his joy was in the Lord and the salvation that would ultimately come. And it's the same thing that Peter is saying here. While there's pain in the trials, Peter says, you rejoice. So it's not this joy that it's talking about. It's, it's not saying, so just put a plastic smile on your face when you're going through difficulties for following Christ. You know, it's not somehow saying, deny the reality of your pain and the difficulty that you go through when you follow Christ. No, it's not saying be stone cold hearted. No, it's saying you still have a deep seated joy. This kind of deep seated transcendent joy and satisfaction in this life because your joy is rooted in, this, in the Lord and his salvation. And this joy comes from being what? From being spiritually alive because he's chosen you. You see, it's when our focus or our meditation is on our difficult circumstance, whatever trial that you're going through for following Christ, when our focus and our meditation, everything about us is about, oh, this difficulty in front of me. You know, why is all this happening because I'm following Christ? What happens then? We lose our joy. But when we are focused on the Lord and his salvation, then we will begin to experience a joy that is not 
affected by our present circumstances. See, nobody, no one, whether Christian or not, nobody in this world wants to be joyless. And especially us as Christians, we all want to be joyful. So let me ask you, where does your joy lie? Does it lie in the things of this world? Or does it lie in God and Christ and his future salvation that's coming for us? See, the only way we can have joy that is not deterred by our circumstances is as we meditate on God's word and remind ourselves who this God is, who Christ is, and and this great work of salvation. And as we come from that perspective, as our hope is fixed on God and Christ, then we will have a joy that, that, that will not be taken away by anything. You can have all the losses in the world, but that joy will still remain. So yeah, so knowing about God, knowing about Christ and his, what he has done in the past and what he's going to do, this entire work of salvation, it's not just theoretical knowledge. Oh yes, I get that doctrine, tick, let's move on. No, it's about whether you truly understand this about your God and your Lord and Jesus Christ and what he's bringing about. Because when it does that, when you really understand it, You know what happens? It colors everything that you see. It colors this entire world with that perspective. And then that brings you joy. Because again, you're reminded, this world is not my home. My home is with my Savior. And sometimes... We get off track. Or as we are just in the world and the world just makes it think that this is reality or this is the everlasting reality, we go off track. And then what do we need to do? We need to be reminded from God's word. And that's exactly what Peter is doing here as the Christians are facing difficulty for following Jesus Christ. But notice, in order to give encouragement, Paul doesn't just, pardon me, uh, Peter doesn't just say, okay, just think about what's coming and that, that great living hope that you have. He gives more reasons as well. Look how he qualifies this trial or those various trials. He says, though now for a little while you are grieved by various trials. Yes, the trials may seem numerous. It may seem unending. But when you compare now to what you will experience in eternity, it's only a little while. See, your life and your trials in this world are only for a little while. It's a, it's a puff of smoke, to borrow the language of uh, James. While in the, when you compare it to the rest of your eternal life. Remember what Romans 8, 18 says? For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. I love that. What is being said here? That there's no comparison between your suffering now, your trials now for being a Christian, and the coming glory that will be revealed to you. It's not even worth comparing. Because that glory that will be revealed to you is on a totally different scale. You can't compare it with anything in this world. That's what's awaiting you in the future, and it will be for all of eternity. And so Peter says, compared to that, compared to eternity, 
what you're going through now and this life of yours, where you're being grieved by trials, it's only for a little while. You know, I, I, I like how one commentator said, he said that we need to, quote, know what time it is and orient ourselves to God's future. That's a good way of putting it. See, if you, it's like if you're having a long day at work and then you look at the time and you realize you've just got an hour left, then you'll be like, oh, I've just got one more hour left. I'll just keep working and I'll be done in an hour. It's, it's in some sense, that's, that's what Peter is trying to do. Christian, do you realize what time it is? The time is now. And now is only for a little while. It's not going to go on forever. But what's coming, it's glorious. And it's for eternity. But Peter doesn't just say it's only for a little while. Look at what else he says. Notice he also says, if necessary, you are grieved by trials. Necessary according to what or according to whom? According to God. See, only if God has deemed it necessary, you will undergo these trials. Yeah, sometimes the opposition and the harassment that you face may be very short-lived. And other times it may be longer. And sometimes it's other ways in which you suffer. And not everyone will be going through trials all the time for being a Christian. But either way, the point is, these trials will come to pass only if God deems it necessary. See, that's why for some, for some Christians, you know, in certain countries, for being a Christian, they undergo severe persecution. You know, they're, they're, they're tortured, physically persecuted. It costs them their lives. But for those of us living in countries like Australia, it's, it's a lot more subtle. You know, there, there, there's no physical torture or persecution of that sort. And why is that? Again, because God has deemed it so. These trials will come to pass only if God deems it necessary. Now, does that mean God is cruel? Or that, you know, or maybe those people in those countries, they're being persecuted so much, that's because maybe they've done something wrong and God is punishing them for that. No. Remember who Peter is writing to. He's writing to faithful Christians. They're following Christ. They're not living in overt sin. And it's precisely because they're following Christ, they're facing these trials. Then, then, then why? why? Why are trials and opposition and harassment necessary as we follow Christ? Peter says, it's because of what it does to your faith. And here we come to the second point of why we should rejoice in our suffering. First, it was because of our hope. Second, it's because of your faith. And that's in verse 7. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, the trials and the pain for following Christ are necessary to test the genuineness of your faith. And it ultimately results in praise and glory and honor when Jesus returns. See, the genuineness of your faith will be a cause for joy in the midst of suffering. 
God has designed unique trials for each one of us as we follow him. Not so that our faith can fail. That, that, that's not the point why God sends these trials. But so our faith can persevere and be proven genuine. It's for our own good. And really, here there's a comparison and a contrast that's been made with the refining and purifying of gold. We know this, right? When you have crude gold in, in its crude form, it's mixed with rock and other impurities. And so you take this gold, this impure gold, this crude gold, and you subject it to extreme heat. And as you subject it to this, this fire, this extreme heat, all the impurities then come up to the surface. And that's kind of skimmed off. And then what's left then is just pure gold. Genuine, pure gold. You know, in Peter's time, gold was one of the precious metals that was that was there. And it was considered as one of those things that would last a lifetime without ever being corroded or destroyed. But Peter's point is, even a precious metal like this, this will perish too in light of eternity. It won't last for all of eternity. But faith that is purified by the fiery trials it results in genuine faith. A faith that is more precious to God. It's a faith that will last. It's a faith that will endure and persevere into eternity. In other words, Peter is saying, you can take the most precious thing in this current world, and that will not compare to how precious your faith is as it's tested through fire and it comes out as genuine, purified faith. Brothers and sisters, whatever difficulty you're facing because you're following Christ, know this, God is, has sent that trial, he has deemed it necessary to purify and strengthen your faith. And you know what it does? It proves to you and others around you that, that your faith is genuine. That you're willing to go through, through these difficulties for your faith. You see, tri trials, it has a way of smashing all our false hopes. See, if we've put our hope in something here and, and some big trial comes, we realize, oh, that's not important. I shouldn't be putting my hope on that thing or that person. That's what trials do. It has a way of just smashing all our false hopes and makes us clear, you know, who our hope is. Where our faith should lie. And so as a result of going through that trial, what comes out on the other end is a more purified and a stronger faith. It's not a faith that will fail. It's not a faith that will weaken as a result. It's a faith that will get stronger and stronger and purer and purer and become more and more genuine what it's supposed to be like. See, when you go through difficulties for being a Christian, it will take away all the excess dross that is attached to your faith. And what's left is what is so precious in God's eyes. A genuine, pure, strong faith. You see, the, the, the precious Christians that Peter is writing to I mean, they're, they're willing to go through opposition and, and mocking and shaming and, and even persecution. They're willing to go, go through trials of various shapes and sizes for following Christ. 
And this proves the genuineness of their faith. Why? Because otherwise they would have quit a long time back. They wouldn't want to go through these trials. So genuine faith, this is enduring, persevering, long-lasting faith. It'll persevere to the end. And if it will not persevere to the end, it is not real faith. See, that's why in the parable of the four soils, uh, you, you, know, you get a glimpse of what is said here. I just want to read uh, just the explanation of the parable of the four soils. That's from Matthew 13, verses 18 to 23. Just listen as I read, Matthew 13, 18 to 23. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes away and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word of God immediately receives it with joy. So there's apparently at that moment, there's some joy about receiving God's word and the gospel. Yet, he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But, care, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of the riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and another thirty. What's he saying? That it's only persevering faith that is genuine faith. So let me ask you, how is your faith? Do you and others recognize that you have genuine faith? Maybe you think you're a Christian because you had some experience 5 or 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. But when you look at your life now, and others look at your life, there's nothing really there. Perhaps it's the trials of this life that has caused you to turn away from your faith. Then let me tell you, you stand on shaky ground. Because the trials are not meant to take you away from God, they're meant to purify you and strengthen your faith. My friend, I would say that you should have no assurance if you're simply resting on some experience that you had in the past. If you're simply just putting on a show in front of others, but deep down inside, you know that you're just living for yourself, then you stand on shaky ground. And if you go on like this, on the last day, you will face the perfect standard of evaluation by a perfectly holy God. And you will fail. And you will suffer the eternal justice and wrath of God. Now, as you examine your life, and you realize you're not a Christian, because even though you know certain truths about the Bible, you know that your life doesn't show it. At least not right now. You're just putting on a show for others. And you realize this, and you realize you're just living for yourself, and you're doomed, and yes, I am a sinner. And you're feeling helpless this way, not knowing what to do. Then let me tell you, there is hope for you. There is still hope for you. 
Because God, in His great mercy and love, sent His beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to this world. This world that is full of people who have sinned and rebelled. People like you and me. And then he died on the cross. Yes, the Son of God, the beloved Son of God, died on the cross for wretched people like you and me. But he didn't remain dead. He was raised from the dead, proving that his death was enough of a payment to wash away the sins, to, to, for the forgiveness of the sins of his people. So my friend, if you find yourself on shaky ground, let me call you today to come to Jesus right now, right this very moment, and put your trust in him. Stop banking on some experience that you may have had years before. Stop pretending and putting on a show for others. Will you not turn to Christ today? Why would you wait? And if you say, I believe, I, I really understand now what Jesus has done for my sin and that my righteousness comes not from me trying to put on a show or not from me banking on some experience before. It comes, my righteousness comes only from Jesus Christ. Then I would say, then turn away from your sin. Turn away from your pride and continue to follow Christ. Yes, it will cost you, but it's worth everything. There's nothing that will bring you more joy and satisfaction than being in this intimate relationship with God. And if you're in that relationship, God will strengthen you and empower you to keep following Jesus till the very end. If you want to know more about this, if you want to talk to me or one of the elders, please email us and you can find our email on the church website. So Peter says, your trials, they're not meaningless as you follow Christ. Every trial that you face for being a Christian Every single one of them, small and big, short and long. All of them have a purpose. They purify your faith and they prove that your faith is genuine as it endures through the trial. You know, that's why in countries where persecution is so severe, where if you call yourself a Christian, people come and torture you or the government comes and tortures you where you're imprisoned or uh, you know, death awaits you, in such countries you will hardly find something called as a fake Christian. Do you know why? Because the cost is too high to be a Christian. Nobody would pay such a high cost if their faith was in genuine. And often it's Christians who live in such adverse conditions that are some of the most joyful Christians. I'm sure you've heard of stories of Christian martyrs who, you know, they're singing hymns and singing praise to God as they're being led to be killed, to be slaughtered. That's what genuine faith is. It perseveres. So Christian, the next time you face opposition for being a Christian, maybe it's mocking, maybe it's loss of certain jobs, maybe it's a certain position somewhere, or maybe it's something within the family or, or, or in the neighborhood, don't be tempted to compromise. 
No, instead remind yourself that God has deemed it necessary to purify your faith. And as your faith endures through it, and your, and your dependence on the things of this world are taken away, what is left is a greater and true representation of who a Christian should be, who a follower of Christ should be. And what happens as a result? You and others around you can be assured that, yeah, what I have is is genuine faith. Now let me ask you though, but why would our faith persevere? Why, because we have more grit or more strength than others? No. See, as we persevere in our faith, we realize it is God who's empowering us and who's strengthening us. That's what we saw in verse 5 last week, isn't it? How is it that God guards and protects us? Through our faith. As we persevere in our faith, that's our responsibility, we realize ultimately it's God who's enabling us to keep moving on in our faith. And so this kind of lasting faith, which is purified through trials, is precious. It's precious in God's sight. It's more precious than anything else in this world because nothing else in this world will persevere like that. Nothing else in this world will last like that. And it is so precious that when Christ returns and examines our life, our faith too will be rewarded. Look at the second half of verse 7. It says, The tested genuineness of your faith may be found to result in what? In praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I, 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 I love that. It's God who gives us the faith. It it is God who helps us to persevere, empowering us. And then ultimately, he rewards us for that genuine faith that we have. Where he looks on us and says, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, verse Verse 13 of 1 Peter calls it the grace of God that will be brought to you at the revelation of Christ. Verse two, uh, chapter 2 and 7 says that the believers will be honored. Chapter 5 and verse 4, it talks about receiving the crown of glory that you and I will share in, in His glory and honor. Oh, what a privilege it is, isn't it? That's the privilege for a Christian. That's the privilege for everyone who has genuine faith. And we're given, and when we are given that praise and honor and glory, it ultimately results in God's own praise, in Christ's own praise and honor and glory. Why? Because he is entirely responsible for this. Not us. It was nothing of us. It was his doing within us. His working in us. Oh, what an encouragement this would have been to the precious Christians as they were facing hostility around them. And what an encouragement it is for you and for me. Yes, in this world, because of your faith, people may oppose you, persecute you, harass you, mock you. But when Christ appears, you will get the highest honor and praise from Christ himself. And the rest of the world will be hushed. And when will that when will that happen? when Christ returns. So Christian, let me ask you again. What time is it now? A little while. 
Till that time when Christ returns, we should say along with 2 Corinthians 4.17, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So why should you rejoice in the midst of your present trials for following Christ? Because of your hope. Secondly, because of your faith. And thirdly now, because of your love. Look at verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I want you to think of who's writing this, Peter. He was an eyewitness of Christ. He saw Christ in the flesh. He spoke with him, ate with him, traveled with him, heard him teach, perform miracles, saw him mistreated and crucified, then even resurrected. He was an eyewitness of the ministry of Jesus Christ while here on earth. But these Christians that he's writing to, they've never physically seen Jesus. They've never heard him speak. They've never seen him rise from the dead. And Peter says, you haven't seen him yet, even in the midst of your trials, you love him. You agapower him. It's that agape love. That love where you desire him more than anything else. Where you're committed to him above everything else. That there's no other competing loves. It's a sacrificial, self-denying kind of love. See, Jesus said in Matthew 10, 37... Whoever loves the father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. What's that saying? It's meaning if, you, if your love for me, that is Christ, is not supreme, so much so that you'll deny everything else and everyone else, you cannot follow me. It's denying yourself, loving Jesus, and following him. See, what's the first commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And it's the exact same thing here, except God now is in the person of Jesus Christ. Love Jesus with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. See, Christianity is not fundamentally a a belief in mere information or doctrine although doctrine and that that kind of information is important. No, Christianity is still fundamentally about a belief in a person, and it's the person of Jesus Christ. And that belief in Jesus Christ is fundamentally expressed in a love for him, in a total commitment for him. I want to quickly take you to an incident between Christ and Peter in John chapter 21. Peter denied Jesus three times whilst he was undergoing that, the trial before he was crucified. Now Jesus has risen from the dead. He's appeared to the disciples. He's asked the disciples, now uh, go to Galilee and wait for me there. And while they were there in Galilee, Peter along with some others have gone back to fishing. Now Jesus comes to Galilee, Uh, he comes and approaches Peter, and he asks him one question. He asks him one question, and asks that question three times. And this we find in John 21, verses 15 to 17. And you know what the question is? Do you love me? Do you love me, Peter? with that singular, committed, sacrificial, agape love. And you know how Peter responds? He says, Lord, you know I I love you, but he uses a different word, phileo. 
which is more of a, a strong affectionate love, a, a brotherly kind of love. But in that love, they, you know, that emphasis on that full commitment, that self-denying component of that agape love is not there. Why is Peter responding this way? Because Jesus is saying, do you love me with that full commitment above everything else? Are you committed to me? Do you love me this way? But Peter says, no, I have a strong affection for you. But why is he reticent of not using agape? Because Peter's messed up big time. So he can't bring himself, because he's just denied Jesus three times. He can't bring himself to say that he loves Jesus with this agape kind of love. So now Jesus asks him a second time, Peter, do you agape love me? And Peter responds the same way, Lord, I, I phileo love you. Now a third time, now Jesus changes from that agape love, brings it down to what Peter is saying. Okay, phileo love, Peter, do you love me this way? Do you have strong affections for me? And this time Peter says, Lord, you, you know everything. And I can at least confidently say that I have affections for you. See, the point isn't that Peter didn't have agape love for Jesus. He did, but he wasn't quite there because he had just messed up. It was growing and, and maturing, so Peter couldn't bring himself to use that word agape, that committed, fully committed kind of love. But Jesus knew all along. Jesus knew all along that Peter had this kind of love. He could see his heart. The reason why Jesus was asking Peter was so Peter could search his own heart. In fact, church history tells us, you know how Peter was killed for following Christ? He was killed by crucifixion. And not just anyway, he was crucified upside down. And do you know why? Because Peter said, I'm too unworthy to be killed like my master. Now that's agape, fully committed love to his savior. Now why do I bring this up? Because what Peter is telling these precious Christians is that you, you precious Christians that are scattered, you have this kind of agape love even though you have not even seen Christ. He's commending them that even in the midst of all these difficulties, that their love for Jesus has not waned, even though they've never physically seen Jesus. He's saying, you're, you're walking by faith and not by sight. Or more specifically, you are loving Jesus by faith and not by sight. And why do they love Jesus like this? It's not because they were special or they had a greater quotient of love within themselves. It's because God made them spiritually alive. It's because the faith that they have as a result was being strengthened. It was being purified through trials. And now it's evidencing in everyday life as how? As a self-denying, fully committed to Jesus Christ kind of love in everyday life. See, we're in the exact same position, isn't it? Just like the Christians that he's writing to. Because you and I haven't physically seen Jesus or physically heard Jesus. And as we follow Christ and the trials come, we can be assured that these trials are to purify us and strengthen us. And guess what results in this agape kind of love? A love that is committed for Jesus and Jesus alone, and it keeps growing. And you know what this kind of agape love results in? Supreme joy. See, he says, though you have not seen him, you love him. 
Though you do not see him, you believe in him. See, it's connecting love and believing. Because the evidence of that faith, evidence of that genuine faith is what? That, that love that you're exhibiting. So you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. You're, you're filled with a joy inexpressible that, that you cannot even put to words. You know, haven't there been times in your life where you've been so joyful in the Lord when you come to realize afresh who this Lord is, who Jesus is and what he has done and what he's doing and, and what he will do. You know, you, you can describe those moments in words, that kind of joy that you experienced. And Peter's point is this, this is the Christian life. As your faith grows through trials and your eyes begin to be more and more fixed on Jesus with a committed love for him that is growing and abounding, it'll result in joy inexpressible that you cannot put to words. In fact, he adds, this joy is filled with glory. Meaning it's, it's a taste of what's coming in glory. It's a foretaste of heaven when you will be home away from this foreign world. It's a taste of that glory that's coming, this joy that you experience. And that's why then Peter says in verse 9, you're obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. See, this love for Jesus and this joy inexpressible that you are experiencing, do you know what that means for you, Christian? It means that you are obtaining the outcome of your faith, which is none other than the salvation of your souls, the salvation of your being. It means that right now, right this very moment, you are obtaining your salvation. Or in other words, you are being saved. This is evidence of you being saved. Yes, you are saved. Yes, you will be saved in the future. But in a very real sense, your love for Jesus as your eyes are being fixed on him alone and as it's growing and as your joy that you and the joy that you're experiencing is evidence that you are being saved. This is a small taste of your salvation that is coming. And you know what? Yes, you're fixed on him right now spiritually. And your eyesight, spiritually speaking, is becoming clearer. But oh, when that final salvation comes, everything will be clear. You will physically see Christ, the one whom you loved, whom you've never seen. Then you will have a love and commitment for him like you never knew. You will have a joy in his presence that you've never experienced before. And this, all of this will be for all of eternity. But what time is it now? A little while. And even though it's hard to follow Christ because of all the opposition from a world that does not know him, we have greater reasons to have joy even in the midst of these trials as we follow Christ. And the reasons are the hope that we have, the faith that we have, and the love that we have. It's a taste of what's coming for us. It's evidence that we're being saved and one day we'll be with this great Jesus. So let's fix our eyes on him now. You know, let everything in this world go strangely dim and let's fix our eyes on him and follow him for we are being saved this way. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for Christ. We confess, Father, that 
when difficulties come, especially when we want to follow Christ, that we focus on the things of this world, not realizing your purposes and all that, and not realizing that you're actually strengthening us, not realizing that you're growing us in our love for Jesus, not realizing that you are growing our joy, not realizing that you are actually in the process of saving us through this. Father, we are so thankful for your work in our lives and for this great salvation. And we look forward to that day when the prize of our salvation, who is Jesus himself, whom we have not seen but love even now, that we will be with our Savior and our Lord. Father, we look forward to that day. Please help us to be faithful to you. Persevere us in our faith as we endure through trials and as we persevere. Help us, we pray, this week, for we pray all this in Christ's precious name. Amen.